Hey everybody, it's Mrs. Malloy again. This is lecture number one, The Birth of England and France, Conflicts Between England and France, and the Bubonic Plague. Okay, so when did England and France become nations anyway? Whoa, hold on, didn't we just learn about feudalism as the driving force behind Europe's political situation during the Middle Ages? When did these regions become countries as we know them? You know, these are just some of the topics we'll cover today. You know, France and England's journey to countrydom is going to set the stage for future democracies. Yes, really. Concepts like trial by jury, laws that apply to all people regardless of background, also known as common law, and the whole concept of the common Joe or minion having rights written down by a government in the form of laws. Hey, you know, all of these things developed when England and France emerged as countries during the Middle Ages. First off, who were the people of England, or who were they back then? Well, there had been many invasions by various tribes that eventually are going to lead to a concept of what we now call an English identity, or, you know, people identifying themselves with an English group. After years of being raided by Danish Vikings and uh, tribes called the Angles and Saxons, these were all Germanic tribes, you know, what we now call England was then conquered by a Danish king, Denmark. He's then going to help combine the various tribes into one group of people. And after various struggles for power and the death of a guy named King Edward in 1066, England was invaded by the Normans, who were people um, from what we now call Normandy, France. King Edward's cousin, a guy named William the Conqueror, was from Normandy, and he invaded England to claim the throne. This invasion resulted in a battle called the Battle of Hastings. The Normans kicked major booty, and William is going to claim England as his personal property. 200 Normans are going to swear their loyalty to William after this, and they were all given bits of land that had been taken from the English lords who had lost the war. And thus, hey, England was born with centralized rule. In other words, with King William in power. So that's 1066. England was pretty much a country. All right, well, England's government has changed over time. And it continued to change over time. It actually continued um, uh, after 1066 and eventually is going to include a, a legislative body called Parliament. So England's government, as it changed over time, you know, there were various kings who tried to do two main things. They tried to, one, maintain control over French lands across the channel, and two, um, kings are going to fight to have control over the church in England. Many kings are going to try and do this or accomplish these two things by, by marriage. And yep, that's right. Back then, they didn't really marry for love. Rather, they were trying to secure alliances and power. A great example of this happening was an early English king named Henry II, who married a French girl named Eleanor of Aquitaine. Now, in French, it's Eleanor of Aquitaine, um, but we say Aquitaine, okay, or Aquitaine, if you've got the real American accent. Anyway, by marrying her, he gained control over much of France. Nice. Anyhow, Henry ruled England from 1154 to 1189, and he introduced such concepts such as conducting trials by using 12 neighbors to judge an accused person, which became known as trial by jury, and the impetus for cool movies like 12 Angry Men, but more on that later. Over hundreds of years, English kings are going to strengthen their own power by having laws created by judges by which people were required to live. This became known as common law. Write that down. And it became the basis for laws in many Western cultures, including our own. All right, well, when Henry died, he left power to his son, Richard the Lionhearted. You know, that brave guy we, we talked about from the Crusades, remember? Nice nickname, Lionhearted. Sounds brave. After Richard the Lionhearted died, his younger brother, John, took over. And poor John, he must have been perhaps not quite as strong as his big bro, considering that John's nickname was John the Soft Sword. Poor guy. Anyway, the nickname most likely originates from the fact that he lost all of the French land that he had in battle to the French. 
which really perturbed all of his nobles, who then forced him to relinquish much of his power as king by signing what became known as the Magna Carta, or the Great Charter. You really need to write that down, Magna Carta. This document is going to hold future English kings responsible to their people by guaranteeing certain basic political rights, such as, one, no taxation without representation, two, trial by jury, and three, protection under laws. Basically, the Magna Carta is so important in history because it helped guarantee basic laws in society, which are now basic legal rights in England and the USA, yo. Well, after John, a king named Edward I came to power. King Edward helped create a legislative body that we now call Parliament, and this means a lawmaking group. And the reason why he created Parliament was so that he could raise the funds that he needed to attack France. Yeah, Parliament was created as a battle strategy, not because some nice king decided to give the common dude more rights. Just saying. Eventually, commoners would be allowed to serve in Parliament, not just nobles, and it will become known as the Model Parliament by 1295. Anyway, Parliament was called into session whenever the king needed more money for a war. But you know, Parliament wasn't just about the king getting money. Yeah, it was actually a check on royal power. In order to get that money that he needed, the English king was going to have to listen a little to his own people in the Parliament. This is going to set the stage, I argue, for future representative democracy. But again, more on that later. So we've learned about how England basically became a country. Now what about France and baguettes and mimes and striped shirts and l'accent français tout ça? I'm getting there. Don't worry, mes amis. Because we all know Madame Malloy will talk about la France, bien sûr, because she is a complete Francophile as well as someone who eats way too much creme brulee, but more on that later. So how did France become La France? Okay, so by the middle of the medieval times, France had about 47 different territories, sort of like states, you know? Each of these territories was governed using the feudal system. I mean, hey, it was the Middle Ages, and you know, we've already learned that during the Middle Ages, that's how kings, princes, and nobles retained control over their land politically, you know, agreeing to protect their subjects in exchange for loyalty. We've also learned about the Carolingian dynasty. Think Charlemagne's empire, endorsed by the Pope, Holy Roman Empire, and all that good stuff. So yes, once the last of Charlemagne's ancestors passed on, a new family called the Capet, it looks like Capets, uh, began ruling those 47 territories pretty much as one big country, establishing a new ruling dynasty, or family, which became known as the Capetian dynasty. The first of the Capetian kings was a man named Hugh Capet. Oh, it looks like Hugh Capet, but all right, it's pronounced American style Hugh Capet. And, you know, the French don't pronounce the ends of many words for a number of reasons, so it's actually Hugh Capet, okay? The bottom line is, um, the whole time England was busy strengthening itself as a nation with powerful kings and a parliament, Capetian kings in France were conniving to get even more territory and expand their influence. Hey, vice versa with the English kings, I might add. So what we are essentially going to see is the beginning of quite a bit of animosity between England and France. But again, dun dun dun, more on that later, folks. So. Just to take you through some of those well-known early kings in France, we're going to see a powerful ruler named Philip II from 1180 to 1223. Hey, that's right around the time when the Crusades were happening, right? Yes. Oh, and I might add that Philip II was also a king in Spain, and we're going to take a look at him later. Don't worry, not the same guy. So, anyway, so smart of you to notice that the Crusades were happening between 1180-1223, among some of the Crusades, at least, Yes, you're very smart. Philip II had an intense desire to attack England because his dad had lost land to King Henry II of England. And because, um, you know, uh, let's see. So, yeah, so I'm sorry. Mrs. Malloy is just going off on a major ta tangent here. Let me start again. Philip II had an intense desire to attack um, England because his dad had lost land to King Henry II. 
And, you know, King Henry II from England had married Eleanor of Aquitaine and got a lot of territory from that marriage. This allowed England to gain French territory. Well, Philip II had a series of wars against Richard the Lionhearted, Henry II and Eleanor's son. Philip had more success against Richard's bro. Yes, King John the Soft Sword, remember him? So you also probably remember that poor King John had to sign the Magna Carta because he's going to lose all this land. Yes, that guy. So Philip II, who was later called Philip Augustus, meaning majestic, became so powerful with all this new land that he was able to exert a great deal of control over nobles in French territories. And this is huge, huge, Rochester, huge. So write this down. Philip II helped to centralize his power by creating an organized government system to collect taxes. If you're a ruler and you want to gain land by fighting wars, you need a way to pay for those wars. So you have to tax your subjects or your people. But you also have to do nice things for your subjects or people so that they want to pay you taxes. So you probably will want to legitimize your rule by aligning yourself with the church. And, you know, you're going to want to give the nobles special privileges to make them feel super duper special. And that's exactly what Philip II did in his country. So, what have we learned so far? Hey, French Capetian kings are going to want territory, especially from England. They're going to want to fight many, many wars to strengthen their power. There were well-known Capetian kings, including Philip II, a guy named Louis the Ninth. He was Philip's grandson, yo. Other important Capetian kings included Philip the Fourth, and we're going to see quite a few Philips and Louis in the next few units, all followed by a number after their name, by the way. So don't freak out just yet. Anyway, Philip the Fourth helped to establish France's form of parliament, known as the Estates General, which included nobles and clergy members. This Estates General is going to eventually include three separate estates for the different classes of people that it represented. And eventually the lowest people in society are going to rise up and overthrow their kings and nobles and behead their king and queen, I might add. But again, more on that later when we get to 1789 and, you know, a little known event called the French Revolution. Right. So what have we learned today, people? Hey, both England and France are going to start to become nations ruled by powerful kings. Both countries are going to develop parliaments, and although English Parliament but really limited the power of their people, um, it's really significant today because it shows that kings were checked by a legislative branch. Um, and we're also going to see this to a lesser extent in France as well. Um, and they were able to do this in England with the signing of the Magna Carta under King John, um, but both nations, France and England, um, their creation of a legislative branch in government is going to help plant the seeds for democratic rule down the road. All right, so by the end of the Middle Ages, during the 1300s, we're going to see the emergence of two powerful nation states called France and England. And in addition to fighting one another for land, we're going to see quite a bit of religious stuff happening in each nation as well. As each leader of each nation align themselves with the church and struggle with the church and its immense power across Europe, we're also going to see quite a bit of social stuff happening as a result of the Crusades and all the trade that began after the Crusades, including a disaster known as the bubonic plague. So now I'm going to talk about three series of events. One, things that were happening in the church during the 1300s. The second thing I'll talk about now is the bubonic plague. And then the third thing I'm going to end with today is a huge war between France and England called the Hundred Years War. Let's start with number one, the church. You know, by the 1300s, the church was in big trouble. Popes and kings in France and England were not getting along. Popes were trying to exert their authority over kings, and kings were trying to exert their authority over the church. A great example of this type of fight was Philip IV of France and one of the popes, a guy named Pope Boniface. They engaged in a lot of talking smack to one another, which culminated with Philip having Pope Boniface IV thrown in jail. He was rescued, but then died shortly thereafter. And after this event, the church realized that they didn't have as much power over kings as they had thought, namely because kings had massive armies and weapons. So this is actually going to lead to another schism. Yes, schism means division. 
And technically, there were two separate great schisms. We've already learned that the first of these great schisms within the church was in 1054, when the church was divided into the Western Church, or the Catholic Church, and the Eastern Church, which became known as the Orthodox Church, or Orthodox Christianity. The first great schism is sometimes referred to by the term Eastern-Western Schism. So don't worry and don't get confused. The other great schism is going to happen from or between 1378 to 1417 and it happened within the Western Church. So what was this great schism, you ask? Well, basically, kings and popes had been arguing for a while, and after that whole Philip IV and Pope Boniface incident, Philip is going to move the Pope from Rome to a city in France called Avignon, so he can have more control over the church. And the church is going to attempt to move the church back to Rome, and thus will begin a fight between cardinals of the church in France who wanted a French pope versus cardinals from a church in Italy who wanted an Italian pope. Each group named their own pope and claimed to be the real church. And at one point, there were three different popes at the same time. <laughs> Oops. In 1417, during the Council of Constance, the three popes were required to step down and a single pope was finally named. His name was Martin V, and that whole debacle or event between 1378 to 1417 with the three different popes and then finally Martin V became known as the Great Schism Number 2, but it's also called the Western Schism. So what have we learned? Hey, there were technically two Great Schisms in history, one in 1054 dividing the Eastern and Western Church, and one from 1378 to 1417. <laughs> will the real Slim Shady please stand up? No, I won't rap. And no, actually, will the real Pope please stand up? But, you know, there were other problems in the church as well. Several individuals are going to begin to challenge the church's authority. These included people like John Wycliffe, who said that the Bible was the key to heaven, not the Pope. You know, naturally, this type of talk made the Pope pretty angry. In fact, another guy who was inspired by John Wycliffe's teaching was a guy named Jan Hus. Um, you know, Jan Hus is spelled like Jan Hus. So look on your vocabulary list, people. If you can't spell something during my lectures, it's good practice for life. Well, that and using something called a dictionary. Anyway, Jan Hus taught that the Bible was superior to the Pope, and hey, he was consequently excommunicated and then put on trial and burned at the stake in 1415. Yeah, so that pretty much sums up how the church felt about people, who weren't kings at least, challenging its authority. And this is important because later when we get to the Protestant Reformation, we're going to see other people beginning to challenge the authority of the church as well. The second event that was taking place during the 13 to 1400s in Europe was something called the bubonic plague. <laughs> Ever wonder about that song called, Ring around the rosy, a pocket full of posy, or posies, yeah, well, urban legend has it that this song is about the smell of death from the plague. I'm not sure that's actually true, but who knows? Nice. Anyway, the plague was a deadly epidemic that killed off perhaps one half the Byzantine Empire and about one third the population in Western Europe. It is believed to have spread via fleas on rats who traveled on ships from Asia due to all that wonderful trade and cultural diffusion that resulted from the Crusades. It was nicknamed the Black Death because of the odd, dark, purplish dots that appeared on its victim's skin, including a ring around the rosy or the mouth. Some people argue that it was because of the plague that the Renaissance period took place, I'll, although we'll never know for sure. I mean, it is clear that, that the effects of the plague were widespread, but again, we'll never know for sure. Well, the population is going to decline as a result of the bubonic plague. We're going to start to see um, inflation increasing, there was also, unfortunately, an increase in anti-Semitism. Um, if you recall, that is prejudice against Jewish people. Um, many Jewish people were used as scapegoats in many parts of Europe and were sometimes blagued for the plague, or blamed, rather, for the plague. Go figure. So what we're going to start to see following the bubonic plague is the church losing power as people, to, as people lose faith because of the whole disaster. All right, the final thing I'm going to discuss today was an event known as the Hundred Years' War between France and England. So in addition to having the popes arguing over who was really the pope and the bubonic plague period, English and French kings were busy trying to kick each other's rear ends. 
After the last Capetian king died, France and England fought to see who would control all of that territory. England and France fought on and off from 1337 to 1453. And, check my math, folks, but that's 116 years. So, technically, it should be called the 116 Years War, right? Yeah, so we talk about the Hundred Years War in history because it marked a change in how warfare was conducted in Europe, including the technology that was used. We're going to see the creation of a weapon called the longbow, which was cheap, easy to use, and deadly. You could shoot this thing from far away from your enemies and pierce their armor. So yes, it was a highly effective war tool. It was used at uh, many famous battles during the Hundred Years' War, like the Battle of Poitiers, uh, Battle of Crecy, and the Battle of Agincourt. None of which you should write down today, but if you're taking AP, look at your um, word list. Listen, you should also know that the One Hundred Years' War um, also made a young girl named Joan of Arc pretty famous. Yeah, have you heard of her? Basically, Joan of Arc was a young French girl, aged 13, and she began having visions that she was called by God to save France from the English. Um, she joined the army and was an inspirational force at a, a, a very famous battle called the Battle of Orléans, or Orleans. Sadly, Joan was captured by a group of French people called the Burgundians, who had allied themselves with the English. She was handed over to the English and was not saved by the French king, King Charles VII, who, ironically, Joan had actually helped put into power. And, of course, she was burned at the stake in 1431. All right, well, why do we remember the 100 Years' War today, besides Joan of Arc? We remember the 100 Years' War because we're going to see a lot of nationalism between France and England. And this new notion of fighting for your country, not just your feudal lord, is really significant in history. You know, we're going to see a period of very powerful kings in France, although in England there's going to be a lot of internal turmoil, and including another war called the War of the Roses. Look it up if you're so inclined. But, you know, many historians say that the 100 Years' War marked the end of the Middle Ages, which is sort of silly because no single event could possibly have ushered in all of the changes that were happening in Europe. All right, well, thanks for listening, everyone. Have a nice day.